Welcome to Real Estate Investing Abundance, the show for busy, fulfilled professionals like you to learn how to develop financial independence built on solid, passive real estate investments. Now, here is your host, Dr. Alan Lomax. Hello, enlightened investors. Happy to be back with you again today. I'm your host, Dr. Allen. I know you'll enjoy today's show, and I have a big ask that will only take a moment of your time. Ratings and reviews are the lifeblood of our podcast. To leave a review and a rating, iPhone or other Apple iOS device users, go to Apple Podcasts or iTunes. For all you non-Apple device users, go to podchasers.com. On either site, search for Real Estate Investing Abundance. Once you find us, leave both a review and a rating. Subscriptions are also vital to the show's success, so please be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast app. It's free to subscribe, and you can unsubscribe at anytime. Enlightened investors, happy to be back with you again today. I'm your host, Dr. Allen. If this is your first time tuning in, I know you'll find great value in the show. Are you perhaps a busy professional passionate about the work of your calling, but have come to realize that the hope of developing financial freedom has taken a backseat priorities of following your passion? If you can identify with this, I've got good news. State Talker Capital is an investment company designed for passionate, fulfilled professionals like you to help you delve into financial independence built on solid, passive real estate investments to give you the time freedom to more fully contribute to your calling. We have created an enlightened investor circle just for you. Go to our website, stetucker.com today and enroll in the Enlightened Investor Circle. Members of our circle will find educational information and support for your passive real estate investing goals, no matter your level of investment experience and expertise. Best of all, there's no cause for joining the circle, so go there today and take advantage of this free opportunity while it lasts. With today's guest, we are going to explore what it means to take massive action by moving into your target market. Our guest is a limited partner in 445 units, totaling $36 million in value. His goal in real estate is to create generational wealth, leave a legacy, and provide a better life for his family. He holds degrees in architectural engineering, civil engineering, and an MBA. Please welcome our guest, Luke Debro. Luke, before we delve into the business of passive real estate investing as a limited partner and other aspects of your investment journey, share a memorable experience from your formative years that helped you to be the person you are today. Yeah, there's, um, I mean, there's several of them, of course, but in the context specifically of, of investing and within real estate, my brother, he's two years older than me, and he was entrepreneurial, just like I've been. And I think we ended up getting it from our dad. And he was about 10 years old, and he was planting crops in the backyard. I, we had a peach tree, but then he also had an avocado tree that he had planted. He had pumpkins, squash, tomatoes, other things as well. And we would we would go with my dad running errands. He'd go to the bank, or he'd be going to the grocery store, doctor's office, et cetera. And he always knew everybody at all these different places. And so my brother would end up taking his, you know, his bag along of, of all this, uh, of all this produce. And he would end up selling it right to the people who were there. And of course my dad encouraged it. And so he probably had about 35 or $40. It wasn't a ton of money that my brother had gotten at that point, but this was, you know, late nineties, right? Yeah. It was probably about 1997, 1998. I was, I was younger and my brother had all this money and he had it all in cash, mostly in singles. And he was, and he was, uh, throwing it up and and he was, he was jumping up and down on his bed and he was throwing it around saying, we're rich, we're rich. And I was jumping up and down with him because I'm the little brother and everything that big brother does is cool. And I was saying, we're rich, we're rich. So for him, it was like, I'm rich, I'm rich. And for me, it was, we're rich, we're rich. And so I feel like that was pretty formative because that kind of ended up showing me the power of being able to to go out into the marketplace and be able to add value and then be able to end up getting a return for that. So that that kind of carried on for, you know, the next 20 plus years for me. Well, a great experience there and uh, an enjoyable experience there with your, your older brother there. I'm sure it's something you all celebrate uh, frequently there. 
Well, let's talk about uh, limited partnerships and why you chose that route of investing and what has it done for you in your life? So I chose that. I had been exploring different ways to get involved in multifamily real estate for a number of years, Alan. And ultimately, I didn't want to start out on the active side because I knew it was going to be too much time and energy for me Um, with where I was at that time in my life. I was in my mid twenties then for me, it would, I, at the time I lived in California, I would have probably needed to move into the market in order to really feel comfortable with investing in multifamily real estate. If I was on the active side and that would likely have been Arizona back then. And so because of that, I ended up deciding to go to the passive route that ended up being, I think a better way to break in, especially because of all the knowledge I've been able to gain over the past several years, having had those um, passive investments and being able to have some strong conviction about putting in, you know, five figures into a deal and knowing that, you know, I I'll be getting my return. At least I've done my due diligence here. I should be getting my returns, assuming that, that the business plan is able to be executed appropriately. And so that was very powerful for me back, I don't know, three and a half, four years ago now to be able to end up investing passively in those. And that ended up kind of moving me forward in terms of being able to have more income and be able to end up seeing how being active would end up making sense for me in in the future there. Well, could you give us an example of how it is that you actually got started in limited partnerships? I had a roommate and he was involved in multifamily real estate as well. And and he still is. This was years and years ago, but he had a connection to a general partner for this deal. The first one that I invested in, and the group's name is Wildhorn Capital. They, They own several assets across San Antonio and Austin here in Texas. And so it was really through that connection there, right? It was a 506B offering, so it couldn't have been advertised publicly, but because there was that connection there and my contact, my roommate friend, Garrett, he ended up connecting me um, to the investment and and to the group as well. So that's really how I ended up getting started initially with that passive investment. And of course, there was my own due diligence I ended up doing. Looking back, I did a lot, but I probably could have done, I probably would have looked at certain things instead of other things, right? But that's always, you know, hindsight's always 2020. So it was fortuitous that you just had a, a friend who had a connection there. If you had not had this friend, what would you have done to get into passive real estate? state investing. I probably would have really gotten on newsletters from operators who have podcasts. That's probably the route that it would have taken for me. This group, one of the partners, he does have a podcast and a prominent podcast. It's Reed Goosens. I probably would have started that route or the other podcasts I was listening to at the time, gotten on their email newsletter list. So that way I have visibility of what they're doing and that relationship's being formed. So that way, when they do have an offering, I'm, I'm able to you know have visibility of it and be able to look at the investment opportunity from there. Well, a couple of other questions here. You use this term 506B. Could you give our viewers and listeners just a brief snapshot of what a 506B offering is? So this private, this private offerings, right? And there are public offerings. We have the stock market that's public for a lot of real estate. It is private offerings, not all of them, of course, but specifically 506B offerings are private offerings. And so with that, there are limits around what the SEC allows you to do and not do for that specific type of security. And one of those things is that there's a limit on the public advertising that you can do. If it's a 506C offering, then you are able to advertise it publicly. If it's a 506B, then there has to be a pre-existing substantive relationship there. And it's really literally reaching out to your contact and being able to take it from there. And so a lot of um, GPs and operators, they do start out with 506B offerings because of the barrier to entry with doing a 506C offering. And also there's, you know, there's different limits that, that are there. And, and so um, that's a brief snapshot for the listeners. Correct. And thank you for providing that. You also use the term SEC. And what is an SEC? Um, that's the Securities and Exchange Commission. They they really regulate securities. And for listeners, a security is essentially an investment is maybe the best way to end up looking at it. It's just a fancy word for investment. There's a lot of jargon in the industry and within finance, broadly speaking, but it's essentially an investment in the, in the Securities and Exchange Commission has regulations around those here in the States. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. 
As an industry-leading, relationship-focused, design-built construction firm, Mosaic Construction has worked in many different asset classes from multifamily to retail, medical, industrial, and commercial. Mosaic Construction works to execute interior and exterior renovations with their team of trades and project managers. Their experience with value-add improvements has resulted in increased ROI and long-term value of the assets. They work nationally in partnership with local trades to deliver thoughtful, problem-solving construction management solutions to all their clients. For a personal no-obligation consultation, call Ira Singer, 773-491-3145, or email Ira at mosaicconstruction.net. You can also find Ira on LinkedIn. Okay, so you stepped into the world of limited partnerships through a contact you had, uh, a good friend that you had, and they were offering a 506B offering, which is a private offering, which is regulated by the Securities and uh, Exchange Commission. So you also had talked about you did your due diligence before doing this. What does that mean? What does due diligence entail? So for a passive investor, for a limited partner, I would say it's understanding the deal itself, making sure that you understand what the business plan is and what they're looking to accomplish and what the strategy is. That's one thing around due diligence, being able to understand the financial side of things as well, whether or not the target returns are actually something that fits in with your investment profile and and what you are looking for as an investor. It's also a matter of looking at the partnership itself and whether or not you're you have confidence in them a lot of it does boil down to who the partnership group is right and so it's more so betting on the jockey than the horse so to speak and so those are those i would say that those are those high level basic things that most passive investors can do um, to be able to run their own due diligence and that's probably what a lot of them do i ended up underwriting the deal myself and did projections based off of what their pro forma so I, the reason i say i did that is because i have an engineering background and so was, i just pulled together the spreadsheet and that actually helped me to really dig in and understand these different levers to push and pull and then also secret shopped it as well and so that was something that i think is out of the ordinary for a lot of passive investors but i mean for me at the time i was putting in twenty five thousand dollars and when I was 28, you know, for me, I'm like, well, that was that was a lot of money at the time. And I I had saved up that money and I, you know, I had a high paying job, of course, but I saved up that money and I was going to make sure at the very least I want a capital preservation. If there's the return, that's great. I want to get the return, but I want my capital to be preserved as as a basic piece of it. And so I ended up doing those extra pieces of due diligence beyond what I think most passive investors typically do. And what was it about this particular deal that reassured you that you would get your capital back? And and I mean, I'm sure you were also expecting a return. So what was really the foundation there that said, yeah, I can go ahead and do this and I am pretty certain that I'm going to get my capital back? I think the numbers ended up lining up generally with what was standard within the industry, I would say. Um, that was one piece. Also, the one of the syndicators, Reed, he actually sent me over um, his underwriting spreadsheet. So I felt like that was a strong vote of confidence and I was able to ding into that some. And then also, Alan, with Secret Shopping It, I was able to look at the area with my then girlfriend, now wife. You know, we're able to look at the specific area like at the neighborhood level, be able to get an understanding of what kind of cars are in the parking lot. Is there still really meat on the bones to be able to do this value add with the asset? Is there that opportunity that is there? And so that gave me confidence, you know, that the that the area was solid, that the deal was solid, that there was some confidence behind who the operators were as well. And so that ended up essentially giving me that that ability to, to move forward with it and, and feel confident about what I was doing. Well, you just mentioned value add. When we refer to value add in the industry, tell us what we're looking at. Yeah, I'd say mostly it's referring to when there's some sort of deferred maintenance potentially or the units are outdated and there's an there's an ability to go in to be able to update the fixtures furnitures and uh, and equipment in there and being able to really you know freshen up the unit it's sort of like a you know best way i think of it is like a fix and flip right and i think people can wrap their heads around it if they think about single family it's essentially a fix and flip but for multifamily you can go in change hardware, change cabinets, et cetera, probably do a better paint job, a lot of those things. 
And then from there, you can charge higher rents and then you can eventually end up selling the, the property as well. So that's that's typically how it gets used in the industry is what I've seen. So you had mentioned that you were also comfortable with this particular deal because the underwriting, which underwriting is essentially what we're talking about, is the analysis of the income statements and uh, the cash flow aspects of that and then the return on investment. So you said that you were comfortable with this particular deal because it met the industry standards. So can you just give us a brief idea here of what those industry standards are. So back then, there it was 8%, 8 to 10% cash on cash. And this deal specifically was 8% cash on cash. And that was a hurdle there. So that was a preferred return. Everything after that was a 70-30 split, meaning that for every dollar after 8% of a return, 70% would go to the limited partner and 30% would go to the general partnership group and then also essentially doubling your your investment in a 5 year time frame the irrs in the mid to high teens i don't remember the exact number at this point but the vast majority of the cash flow happens at sale uh, for for this specific strategy we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor would you ever invest all your money in a single stock very unlikely Yet, investors are willing to risk $50,000 to $100,000 in a single property in real estate all the time. Avestor is the world's first customizable real estate investment platform. Investors can build their own custom portfolio selecting investments across multiple asset classes such as single-family homes, multifamily, student housing, self-storage, and shopping centers. You can also invest across multiple markets and different time frames. Avestra also enables other real estate entrepreneurs and syndicators to build and use Avestra's infrastructure and cloud platform to create their own customizable real estate funds. To learn more, visit us at avestrainc.com. Avestra, real estate investing made simple. Okay, well, there's a whole lot more we could go into this, but let's move on here. You took a big leap and you started a podcast and you actually physically moved from California to Texas for the purpose of actually, I believe, being close to the markets that you were actually thinking of investing in as a general partner or as an active investor. Why did you do that? And has that been a good move? And what has come of that? My my wife and I, we, we ended up deciding, or we, we ended up looking at it about a year and a half ago, that if we were really going to make much more progress in what we and what our plans were for ourselves, for our families, and for our community, then it would be it would, we'd have to end up being on the active side rather than only being on the passive side. And that was just the decision that made the most sense for us. And so with that, we ended up seeing that when there was a local presence in the market, that that those are the people who ended up being the most successful, broadly speaking, right? Either they could get to their markets very quickly or they literally lived in the market. It was one of those two. So maybe they were a few hours away at most or they were boots on the ground. And so we ended up looking at what that would look like. And having invested passively in San Antonio, we knew that for us moving to Texas would end up making the most sense because we were already familiar at least with that MSA to a certain extent. Yeah, that's that's really why we ended up moving out here. There was some planning that ended up taking place and figuring out what that would look like. I still work a W-2 job. I have a, I have a, a new um, job here in Austin that I started a few months ago. And so that's part of it, right? It's like, so I end up, I'm the sole breadwinner at this point, so to speak. And I work in the morning before work. I work in the evening after work on Make It Rain. And then I work on the weekends, of course. And um, my wife, Daisy, she is full-time Make It Rain at this point, which is a, a huge blessing because she's able to, to end up going out and touring properties. She's able to speak with brokers. She's able to attend other meetings that need to end up happening. And so we've experienced a lot of progress in the past several months, having moved here in early January. We're, we're recording this in, uh, in early April. So we've been here uh, for about three months and we've experienced a lot of growth and progress in doing that even to where um to where now we're involved in a in a deal here actively and we're in the closing process currently and if we hadn't moved here there's no way that that would have happened uh, you know i just i know that for a fact because being here local ends up making such a huge difference 
And um, not everybody's able to do that, of course, but that's just the right fit for us and what ended up being the best decision for the two of us. Well, good. I'm glad that worked out for you. And that does make sense, particularly when you're first starting out. It, I think it really is important to be in the markets that you're in, because if you're investing in properties way across the country and you don't go check those out, you are really taking a big risk because they can look so beautiful on the internet and very, very different when you really get there on site. So in 2020, you had a business moon and attended a Secret X, a four-day networking event. Tell us about that. Yes. So my wife and I, we've been together. We were together for about six years at that point when we got married back in October. And because of the travel conditions with COVID, it would have been untenable to really go anywhere that we wanted to for our honeymoon. And so with that, Alan, I don't know who had the idea first, but Daisy's the one who vocalized the idea first of just going and visiting Texas because we already knew that we were planning to move to Texas. So we ended up doing four days and three nights in Dallas and then also in Austin as well. Had about 20 meetings, did a couple of property tours as well. And so we we're literally just, it was, it was, it was a it was a week of work, right? Um, but it didn't feel that way simply because we we were moving in a direction that we wanted to go in. That was huge for us. And we felt like we made a lot of progress. And then we we're able to determine not only more about the markets themselves, but then also where we personally would want to end up living as well. So it was beneficial in that way. And the other event that you ended up mentioning, Secret X. So that's uh, organized by several gentlemen, uh, Garrison Gilbert, Dave Tupin, Kevin Easterly, and Alex Ritz. And it's essentially a, a networking event that takes place over about four days, except it's not like a big conference necessarily. I know the one that I went to this past year in Jamaica was uh, 40 of us total. And there's maybe an hour or two of actual you know, personal development, talking about whether it's real estate or working on your business or those sorts of things. But the vast majority of it is really just networking and having fun and being able to get to know people on a different level and on like a personal level and being able to connect with them that way. So that way, you know, in the future, when there are potential partnership opportunities, then you're able to, to end up having those because you have this this deeper relationship and this deeper bond that you've ended up building. So we were at a smaller resort and that's how they design it because they want it to be a bit more intimate. And even there's one coming up here in about three weeks and that one's in Costa Rica and they're doing something similar where it's at a small, it's at a small resort. Everyone that, who's going there, they're involved in business somehow. The vast majority are involved in multifamily real estate. And if they're not, then they're involved. They have franchise like fitness franchises or they, they take care of like waste management. Everyone's a business owner there and they're all there to, to grow and to be better and, and really to be able to, to move forward with, the, with their lives. Enlightened investors will be right back after this important announcement. I have a big ask that will only take a moment of your time. Ratings and reviews are the lifeblood of our podcast. So to leave a review, iPhone or other Apple iOS device users, Go to Apple Podcasts or iTunes. For all you non-Apple device users, go to podchasers.com. On either platform, search for Real Estate Investing Abundance. Once found, please leave a review and a rating. Subscriptions are also vital to our show's success, so please be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast app. It is free to subscribe, and you can unsubscribe at any time. Well, before we go into our last segment here, Luke, tell our viewers and listeners how they can get in touch with you. And I think you have something to offer them for actually getting in touch with you. The best way is going to our website. It's makeitraincapital.com. And you can reach out to us there. I'm on LinkedIn as well. You can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, you can always email me. It's Luke, L-U-C at makeitraincapital.com. I'd say schedule a call if you're so inclined. Our listeners do schedule calls and we actually do get on the phone with people and being able to offer different resources for them and point them in different directions. In terms of the, the offer that you were speaking about, Alan, we pulled together a essentially a tool to be able to guide people through 
how to invest in order to reach their goals and what that timeline looks like. So you can end up figuring if you know what your expenses are and you know how much money you, you have to invest and what sorts of returns you're looking at, um, then you can end up figuring out what that timeline ends up looking like. And this is for the most part, really within multifamily investing. And it's for the most part, really as a limited partner. And it's, and it's a tool that we're pulling together right now. So if you go to our website, you will be able to see that. So that's at makeitraincapital.com. And uh, it's something that we're excited about. And we're, you know, we're working hard to make sure it's something that's super valuable and, and you know, listeners and passive investors can get a lot of value out of. That sounds like a very excellent tool. So uh, viewers and listeners, be sure to check that out. Another good thing about it, it's free at the moment. It may not always be free because truly that is a valuable tool. Be able to go someplace and to actually put in your goals, objectives, and then to objectively be able to assess where it is you're going to be in a year, five years, 10 years, and, and even further down the road than that. So viewers and listeners, take advantage of that. Luke, let's go into our last segment here and share with us one of your most difficult setbacks in life. And how did you come through that time? And what did you learn from that experience? You know, one big one I can end up pointing to, it hasn't been within investing, but when I was 18, I was starting college and I'd always been smart enough, you know, but college is like a whole nother story. At least it was for me, right? It's like, I couldn't just do my homework in the car before school. I had to actually study. And so the setback was that I was taking calculus three my first year, and it was my actually my first quarter in school. I ended up failing the test, right? And I ended up thinking at the time, you know, like, is this is this really, should I be doing this? Should I be going to college? I, I, I ended up having doubts around that. You know, I ended up going and speaking to the professor. This was maybe a third through the term. Um, and I'm speaking to him and he said, you know what, you'll be fine. You're here, you're putting in the work. Like I, you're at office hours all the time. You're studying. You didn't do well on this. You, you'll end up being doing fine in the course, right? And I ultimately did do did do fine in it. Ended up passing it, thankfully. You know, that was a setback in a way, but it was a good lesson because I ended up realizing how much work I really needed to put in to be able to, to get the outcomes that I was looking for because I didn't have a gauge of that beforehand. But then it was also important, I think, because... Everyone at certain times needs encouragement in different ways. And I think that professor at that time, being able to end up seeing you're making the right steps. And if you're following that right process, eventually the results will come. They may not come and look at the time or it may not look exactly how you thought that they would look originally, but it will end up happening. So that was a, a big thing for me. And that was a setback and how I ended up, you know, overcoming that. And, you know, that first term, I ended up doing a certain amount of studying, you know, and then the studying probably quadrupled or quintupled by the time I was ready to graduate because of because of how much was was going into what I needed to do. So it was a it was a good lesson. Well, it sounds like a good experience and fortuitously a good professor that uh, helped you through that process there, which just points out that I think what is really, really important in our lives is, is really taking a strong look at who are the people in our lives and are we really seeking out people who are helping us to move forward in life. And also the lesson that you learned was, of course, that nothing is free, that if you want to succeed in life, you have to buckle down and and set your sights and goals on that and go to work on it. So Absolutely. A good lesson learned there. So what in your life do you feel most grateful for? For me, it's really being here, like being in America. I know that America has its own issues. You know, no, nobody's house is perfectly clean. But to be born here and to be a citizen and to be educated, right? And to have had a very solid childhood and great parents. And then also even to have parents one of them who was an immigrant, that ends up being a huge benefit, I feel like. And that's something I'm extremely grateful for just because not everybody's in that position, right? And a lot of these things, I've worked hard, right? In certain ways, but other things, I was just born into a situation, right? Like even being born here and having the opportunities that I have, that's something that I'm always grateful for and, and definitely keep in context because there's probably easily a billion people in the rest of the world who would trade their lives with you or I, and they would consider it a godsend, like a miracle if they were able to be sitting here doing what we're doing right now. So that's something that I think about daily and, and is something I'm very grateful for, Alan. Which parent immigrated? 
it was my dad. He ended up coming here from Trinidad when he was uh, 20. Hmm. Well, that's got to be a story in and of itself there. Um, <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, good. I'm glad he came here. And yes, it is a good place to be in many, many respects. Uh, but you're right. There's some things we need to clean house about, but it's still a good place to be. Well, share with us three good things uh, that have happened to you in the last 24 hours. So one thing was an investor call that went very well. That's one good thing that, that happened because we are, we're still in the closing process and working on, on raising equity for, for that deal I mentioned earlier. So that was a positive thing. I would end up saying uh, also having the opportunity to, uh, to exercise is a big one as well. That was something that was really positive that happened because if you don't use it, you lose it. <laughs> um, that's the way I end up looking at it. And another positive thing here, actually uh, speaking with my brother-in-law, he's 18. He's my wife's brother, his, her younger brother. And we were just texting back and forth. His parents are out of the country right now visiting family and and he's at home. And so just checking in with him and uh, continuing to have that relationship with him is, is something that was positive that happened in the last 24 hours here. Well, cool. Well, imagine you've come to the end of your life's journey and you are laying on your deathbed. What do you look back on with your greatest joy and sense of fulfillment and satisfaction? Hmm. I have a lot of big goals for myself and for my wife and I with Make It Rain Capital. But looking back, it would be saying that we that I've had children and and you know God willing children and, and grandchildren that have had opportunities that I could have never imagined and opportunities that my grandparents could have never even close to have imagined, and they've been able to go out and live the life that they want to live, um, and they're good people. And they're adding value to the rest of the world. I would say that that would be huge. You know, I, th I think those are the things that it's easy, especially here in America, we're very, we're very driven by achievements, right? I mean, that's a lot of what we're built upon here. And rightfully so, I think that's a great thing. But I think the, the impact that I could end up making with, with my children and grandchildren and other descendants would end up being the, the biggest thing for me. And that's why I always think about like leaving a legacy and, and what that really ends up meaning. And so, yeah, that would, that would be it, Helen. That would be it. Well, some wonderful things to look back on. You're a very young person. I hope you have a very long life and a very fruitful, prosperous life. And Luke, it has been a real pleasure and a joy to be with you today. Thank you for sharing with us your experiences in terms of limited partnership and your moves into general partnerships and more active uh, investing. Thank you for sharing your experiences. Yeah, thank you for having me, Alan. This is definitely a very interesting take on multifamily or I guess investing broadly speaking. And so it's been it's been a pleasure and appreciate you providing me the platform and the opportunity. That's wonderful. I look forward to many more engagements. Thank you for tuning in to Real Estate Investing Abundance brought to you by Steve Talker Capital, a company working for passionate professionals like you to develop financial independence built on solid passive real estate investments. As part of our efforts to make the world a better place, Steve Talker Capital contributes to activities and organizations committed to better understand the equine. These endeavors attempt to enhance the human treatment of horses worldwide. Steve Talker Capital, working for a world where all creatures, great and small, flourish abundantly. For resources to develop your financial independence, connect with us at stevetalker.com.